Hello, this is going to be the flip side of the faux feminist in fiction essay. This is the pro feminine in fiction essay um, because I actually filmed the last, even though I'm posting them both on the same day, I filmed that one like a month ago and I asked my sister, I was like, is this like too much? Are people gonna get mad at me? And she was like, no, but like have the other one ready to go. So I was like, okay, they're ready to go. Um, so. This is the, uh, well, okay, so the other one was obviously, like, here's a ma major problem and here's how it's exemplified by this character or this story, blah, 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 blah. This one will be very much just um, some examples of female characters who I think are actually, like, really feminist. Um, not feminist, but feminist. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, starting off... I will start with Zelda because I feel like she's maligned so much by people who don't play those games. Um, they don't really understand her, who she is as a character or like what she does in the story. Because people are always like, oh, she gets kidnapped. Princess is getting kidnapped. Blah, blah, blah. Um, you misunderstand, my friends. So if you don't know, I mean, everyone knows who Zelda is. But um, I'm just going to explain like each game because she's very different. If you don't know, um... Every game, there's, like, Zelda, who's a princess, um, Ganon, who's this, like, evil person, warlock, demon, miasma, whatever, and then there's Link, who you play as, who's, like, a, I don't know, kid, elf, warrior thing, I don't know, he, he has many, he wears many hats, and sometimes they talk, but up, up, but up, up, that's a joke if you've ever played Minish Cap. Anyway, um... And, and they each, um, there's this, like, mystical thing called the Triforce, and each of those people have a chunk of it. So Zelda has the Triforce of Wisdom, Ganon has a Triforce of Power, and Link, who you play as, has the Triforce of Courage, and, um, it's, every game they're, like, a reincarnation of their, like, person. So like there's different Zeldas and different Links and maybe different Ganons or maybe he's the same Ganon. It's a, I don't know, different people say different things. Um, anyway, so I've never played the first two Zeldas, so I'm not going to talk about those. Um, Ocarina is the first one I ever played. I didn't actually finish it, so I can't talk about the conclusion, but I know, you know, most of it. Um, anyway, I was very little when it came out. Anyway, uh, so Zelda, you first encounter her, again, you're Link, like, you're playing as this guy. He's the guy in green, if you if you don't know, if you don't know, like, what this franchise is about. Um, you meet her as a little girl princess, and she's basically like, hey, like, my dad is, like, talking to this shady guy, I don't trust him at all, take this magic ocarina, like, bye. And then, obviously, Ganon, who's the shady guy her dad is talking to, like, uses nefarious powers to, um like, basically, like, send the entire kingdom slash world into, like, darkness. What are you gonna do? But Zelda escapes from this because her, like, bodyguard, who's female, by the way, since we're talking about female characters, um, Impa is her name, rescues um, Zelda and, like, takes her away from the castle uh, before everything bad can happen. And then Link, your character, like, time travels with magic swords because, yeah. Um, and, and you go, like, seven years into the future. So, um, I'm going to say, like, spoiler alert, but I, honestly, like, I hope that you know this if you've played Zelda by now, but in the future, you meet this person um, who seems like a man named Sheik, who's this awesome ninja who shows up all over the place and, like, helps you throughout the game to learn these um, magic songs on your ocarina. It's called Ocarina of Time. It's in the title. Um, to, like, open these shrines and awaken these sages. It's very important. You have to get there's six or seven sages, and you have to awaken them all. Um, and Sheik helps you with all of this. And then, of course, it is revealed, bum, 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 that Sheik is actually Zelda, and she's been helping you this whole time. Um, and yes, when she finally reveals that she's Zelda, because she is the seventh sage, like, she gets captured by Ganon. But again, like, before that, she was running around for seven years while you were, like, in a time lapse. Like, she's been running around training to be a ninja for seven years, and then she, like, helps you, like, through these different trials. Um, and it's really interesting, too, because of that dynamic, it's, like, she's wisdom and your courage. Like, you have to do, like, the, like, the leg work, usually, and she has to do the, like, logistics? <laughs> it's really funny, too, because, um... 
I've, uh, I've heard people say, don't teach your daughter to be a princess, teach her to be a general, which is so weird. I'm like, princesses rule countries. Princesses have to be political leaders and be savvy and command generals. It's like, isn't a king kind of a step down from God? Like, isn't a general kind of a step down from princess? Like, yes, it is. Princesses are more powerful than generals. I'm sorry um, that you only think that fighting is important, but actually there's other things in life that are good too. So she, in that game, like deals with those logistics. In Wind Waker, um, at this point in like the saga, Hyrule is kaput. You don't know what happened to it. I won't say what happened to it. You should just play that game. It's so good. Um, she is, this incarnation of her is a pirate captain named, sorry, my camera's being funny. A pirate captain named Tetra. And she kind of, um, Link's sister gets kidnapped and she helps you rescue her along with some other girls who look like her. Like, clearly someone is looking for this Tetra lady. It's obviously Ganon. Uh, and you find that out pretty early in the game. And and so she's helping you. She's a pirate captain. And she knows like there's something important about her, but she doesn't know what. And once she finds out that she is Zelda, this mystical princess, she has to like stay put and like not get captured by Ganon because he's evil and he wants this the Triforce for himself. And yes, she does get captured eventually. And then at the end boss fight, she helps you fight Ganon. Like her shtick, like Zelda's shtick throughout the series is um firing arrows of light. So your your Zelda uh, Link's weapon is the Hyrule, the Master Sword. And Zelda's weapon is like arrows of light. It's always this thing. Um Except in Breath of the Wild where Link uses the arrows. I don't know. I don't care for Breath of the Wild too much. <laughs> uh, I will someday do a video about that. But uh, Zelda... So yeah, she literally helps you in the last fight. You're, you're both like tag teaming this bad guy. In uh, Twi'Pry or Twilight Princess, there's actually two amazing female characters. Midna is your sidekick. In every game you, um, you have a sidekick who... Basically, they, their function is to either target enemies for you or to, like, explain plot-relevant stuff, um, you know, in, in, like, the meta part. But they're always usually plot-significant. So in this game, Midna is, um, she is the princess of this race of people called the Twilight, who, they're, like, from a dark other dimension, which is basically Magic Australia, where Hyrule's been, like, dumping all their, um, dump, 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 that's me dumping a, a, a bag of criminals into the Twilight Realm forever, and, uh, they became the Twi Twilight, um, yeah, <laughs> and wouldn't you know it, they dumped a Ganon in there, and he just messed everything up, what are you gonna do? So, <clears throat> so, at this point, um, Midna has been, like, transformed into this, like, imp creature, and she's helping Link on all these, like, things to try and get this artifact from her tribe to regain her power and her form and fight Ganon. Meanwhile, uh, Zelda is captured in the tower of her castle. How stereotypically princess. Why is she captured in the tower of her castle? Well, because this person who we don't, we're not supposed to know he's working for Ganon, but he is working for Ganon eventually. Um, he basically shows up and is like, hey, I'm gonna like kill all your people unless you surrender. And so she does, she's like, okay, I surrender. Um, she like drops, it's a really dramatic cutscene, she like drops her sword and, and is trapped in this castle, but what she's actually doing is she's basically casting a barrier to surround just the, the castle town so that the rest of Hyrule is semi-okay. It's still kind of a run with monsters, but less so than the actual castle. Um, and another important thing about Zelda, which I think a lot of people don't think about, is it's a Japanese game. And Zelda is a Miko Hime. Miko are, they're kind of like priestesses. It's usually translated as shrine maidens. Um, their job is to like purify things, do rituals. Uh, yeah, like purification and rituals. And then like in a more like mystical sense, like casting out barriers and protecting people from evil spirits. That's their job. And a Miko Hime, so Miko is that shrine maiden, and Hime is princess, so Zelda is a Miko Hime. The idea there is you're a, like a shrine maiden princess, where it's your job is to protect an entire city of people with your mystical powers. 
and spiritual powers. And that's what Zelda is. In every single game, like, whether or not it's super spelled out for you or super not, I feel like, um, some games it's very obvious, like, this is, like, straight up, like, Shintoism, and then sometimes it's very, like, oh, she's just a princess and whatever. But in Twi-Pry, it is super obvious, like, this is what she's doing. And then partway through the game, so she's stuck in her, in her tower, and she's, like, trying, basically she, she tells Midna, like, it's, it's on you, Twilight Princess. Um, and partway through the game, Midna, who I love so much, like, she's, like, one of my favorite characters in all of Zelda. Um, she gets horribly injured, ah! And then Zelda, in order to save her, A, because, like, she knows that Midna and Link can fight on their own, but B, because it's kind of Hyrule's fault for dumping a Ganon into the Twilight Realm, whoops. Um, she gives up her life force and gives it to Midna, so she's, like, dead, but of course Ganon is holding on to that piece of the Triforce, so she's not really dead. And then at the end of the game, at the end of the game, not only does Midna, like, pwn Ganon in the beginning of the boss fight, like, she's such a boss, I love her so much, um, so she takes down his, like, beast form, basically, because Ganon always has these, like, weird different iterations, um, he's not like a human, he's like a weird demon monster miasma creature, like I said, uh, and then, Zelda comes back, like, you basically, you fight her, like, weird puppet form, and then she's back to normal, and again, she and Link fight where he has to do the sword fight part, but she does the bow and arrow part. Again, she, like, this is her job. And in Spirit Tracks, which is a little DS game, it's really fun, people don't usually talk about it, I don't know, oh, sorry, that was me ruining the camera, um, she literally goes on an adventure with you, she gets, um, these demons want to, like, possess her body or something, so she gets pushed out of her body, and she's a little ghost, and she has to help you, uh, even though she's, like, a scaredy cat. It's so cute. Uh, this rendition of Zelda, she's actually, she's, like, the only Zelda who goes on adventures with you, um, but she's actually, like, a scaredy cat, like, she's scared of mice, and, because she, um, she can inhabit suits of armor, but she gets scared if there's, like, mice around, and you have to help each other. Again, you help each other. This is important. Um, and then... In Skyward Sword, it actually explains the whole origin story, I guess, of this weird Triforce uh, reincarnation cycle. And in this one, Zelda goes on her own adventures. She just, she just does it off screen. She has to like purify herself in these different um, mystical shrines. And then, and then, and then she goes through time and keeps Ganon's like dark original, like, super ultra-powerful self that will destroy the world, she keeps him at bay, like, by casting, not casting a barrier, but basically, come on, people, this is how you cast barriers, by the way, <laughs> or like this. Um, for a thousand years, she keeps him contained. Uh, again, like, I'm Ikohime. I would say the Breath of the Wild Zelda is actually the weakest Zelda, even though people think that she's, like, super strong because, um, I don't know. But she... Again, she's an okay character because she has to have her little character arc of, like, doubting herself and then overcoming it. She's just not very wise, which ticks me off. She, over she like, awakens the Triforce with the power of love, and I'm like, that ain't wisdom. Get out. But I will rant. Actually, I will let my brother rant as a guest star <laughs> about Breath of the Wild at a later date. But for now, those are all the Zeldas. And what I love about her is she is an example of what a princess should be. People always act like princess is a weak term. And I'm like, no. Your job as a princess is to protect your people. And that can be, um, and, and what I love about Zelda is all different different ways of doing that. You have her living to fight another day in Ocarina or her like sacrificing herself in Twilight Princess or her uh, fighting, you know, alongside people in, uh, Spirit Tracks and Wind Waker. It's just great. Or, you know, literally holding a, a, a dark power at bay for a thousand years. You know, most princesses don't do that, but Zelda does because she's awesome. And I really wish people would stop acting like she's weak. It makes me so salty. Um, so that's the first pro-feminist character. The next pro-feminist characters, plural, I'm going to say are another princess and her handmaiden. This is a... Okay, it's twa it's uh, Tangled, the series, and I'm not going to talk too much about it because I have another video. It will get its own rave because I really, really, really like it, but 
it's such a good example of what a feminist character two actually there's two main female characters what they should be um and i love it i love it so much so i'm going to talk about cassandra who is the handmaiden and then i'm going to talk about rapunzel because they're very as much as that series is like the, the king of parallelism they also are really good at giving each character very different like arcs and relationships and stuff so the basic like premise of the series is basically okay Rapunzel is now the princess and she's learning how to be a princess and Cassandra is her handmaiden but Cassandra is also the daughter of the captain of the guard and she really wants to be a guard and she's very like responsible and wants to and she's really good at fighting and her closet's full of weapons from her dad. <clears throat> but she also has a huge inferiority complex of, like, feeling like nobody notices what she's doing. Um, or, like, she's not getting anywhere in her career. And I will say, uh, there was one episode where I was about ready to flip a table. And I thought I would hate the show. Because the premise of the episode is, is called The Challenge of the Brave. And there's this, like battle contest thing and Cassandra like is having issues with it because she doesn't feel like things are going her way and I was like oh my gosh they're gonna commit the cardinal sin which is to be like oh you're a girl and you can't fight me 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 which I'm sorry like I hate when that happens in shows it is so preachy and annoying and I'm like please get over it like yes girls can join sports now like please stop acting like we can't oh my gosh and it didn't do that at all. There was no mention of her being a girl. In fact, there's other women in the Challenge of the Brave contest. Um, and so she has, so the, the actual premise of this episode, which is actually super important to her character arc, by the way, like who knew? I didn't know that, like watching the first season. Because this show is very good at making things important later on. It's that she wants to join this contest to prove to everybody that she's like strong and could you know join the the guard and Rapunzel is like I'm gonna join too because it sounds fun and completely overshadows her by accident and it's so good because rather than being like I'm a girl and you gotta deal with it it's like no 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 like it's just these two characters who happen to be women like grading against each other's personalities and it's so good and what I'm gonna say um in relation to my other video, one of the huge problems that I, I forgot to actually say in that video is that I find it backwards of things that are claiming to be feminist um, to basically make an entire character's motivation and um, complexes and everything depend on a man. Like Maleficent, it's like, oh, she, you know, in the old one, she was just this super powerful, like, mistress of all evil. But in this one, well, no, she can't be, like, strong unless she's getting over a man. Um, or the girl Ghostbusters can't, like, be, like, interesting unless it's secretly a metaphor about how no one listens to women. Um, how men don't listen to women. Or Captain Marvel can only be a power fantasy if it's about, like, overcoming, like, men and what they think of you. Whereas an actually feminist story would be like, you know what? Maybe women are just strong. The end. You don't have to prove that you're better than a man or overcome a man or that you're stronger than a man because maybe, boop, you don't have to define yourself by men. And that's my problem with the faux feminist thing is they always define themselves by men about what men think of them and, and grading against men. Whereas in something like Tangled, it's like, no, 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 no. Like, it's not a mm, literally man versus, you know, I like to say man versus instead of person versus because it rolls off the tongue. Cassandra's thing is, it's almost man versus society slash self where she thinks that society doesn't get her or understand her. Even though throughout the series, like if you actually watch it, they slowly do. Her dad gives her a chance um, at being on the guard. And he, uh, they, they entrust Rapunzel's safety to her on the road. Um, but actually it's kind of man versus self where like, she has her own feelings that are like causing like eh, eh. plus like trauma you know it's such a good show i'll rave i'll rave about it later but but it's not cassandra versus a man's world which is so outdated and gross and i'm like please stop writing this into stories feminists and actual feminists like don't ever do that um so yeah i just love it was so refreshing to me where i was like what you have like two characters in a sporty contest and they're both women and nothing has to do with what men think of them? Wow! It's like mind-blowing. 
mind blowing. It was such a good episode. And again, it like deeply shows you like how she feels as a character. And it's actually really important to her character arc of like, this is her feeling about society and Rapunzel and kind of an inferiority complex, but not about an inferiority complex as a woman, but as a person and as an individual. Meanwhile, Rapunzel is a great female character because again, she's also a princess, but, and, and she does actually protect her kingdom a lot, like a huge part of the arc of every season kind of is her um, dealing with like destiny, but also dealing with having to be a princess and what that means for her. And over, it's like really hard. They deal with how hard it is to have that kind of responsibility. Um, but not only does she protect them, and she's also kind of a Mikohime because she actually has magic hair in the series, but she rallies people. Um, repeatedly, Eugene, excuse me, Eugene talks about how, um, how she like won't give up and inspires other people. And she does it often like where she'll, you know, rally the troops and rally people to do something. In the last episode of the entire show, she starts this song where she's basically like, this is the toughest situation we've ever had to deal with, but like we can do it together. And the only way is through and it's like a rally song, um, which I love. I, I, and I think that, I don't know. I feel like, again, with the whole like, oh, be a general and not a princess. It's like, okay, but both of those people have to, like rally the troops, and and, and again, um, jo uh, Joan of Arc, okay, a famous historical woman. Everyone acts like she was a warrior, and I'm like, she was a flag bearer. She didn't fight, and she didn't kill anybody. What she did was she carried a flag into battle to lead people. Like she was a leader, and she never had to throw a punch, and she never had to like pull a sword. She held the standard. She was a standard bearer, and that's what she did. Like an icon. Um, she rallied people. And I feel like that's a very like feminine thing that people don't give enough credit to. Uh, it's very strange to me that people don't act like this is important. And I'm like, well, you kind of need people to, you know, rally the troops, <laughs> cough, and, and, and give people like support. Um, so that's that. Uh, more, more on Tangled in another video. So there's Zelda, there's Tangled. Non-princess people. <laughs> um, I will just say that Another example of a like, great female characters across the board is the Disney Afternoon. If you don't know what that is, it was, I guess, a chunk of time, <laughs> uh, TV time in the 90s, where on Disney Channel they had Chip and Dale and Tailspin and Gummy Bears and the Aladdin TV show, and just a whole bunch of really good, fun, adventurous cartoons for kids. They're just great. Great writing, great comedy, great everything. And I'm actually really glad to see that kind of like re-emerging with the new DuckTales. And honestly, Tangled feels like that era of cartoon, like like how Aladdin was the take on the movie and then Tangled is the take on the movie. It's very good. But in Disney Afternoon, there were so many good female characters who were just characters. Uh, it didn't matter that they were girls. Like, oh my gosh. Okay, I don't know who's watching this video, so I'll try to explain some of these stories to you. Bear in mind, they are for children. There's a lot of talking animals. There's a show called Tailspin, which is if you took the the animals from Jungle Book and put them in a 1940s setting, it makes sense. <laughs> it's really good, but basically, it's the premise is Baloo, like that Baloo. Um, he ha he's like a, a slobby, like lazy pilot who has this plane called the Sea Duck that he loves, but he can't pay the bills on it, and it, I believe it's bought. I forget if the plane is bought or what by this businesswoman named Rebecca Cunningham, who is also a single mother, by the way. And she's such a great character because she is a businesswoman and she's kind of like, not money grubbing, but like she clearly like cares about money and has like some schemes, but she'll also go adventuring with like the rest of everybody. Um, and she's just really cool and interesting and kind of, and she comes off as that like classic 40s lady who's kind of like, I don't know what you'd call it, moxie or not snarky, but just this very great personality. Uh, she's great. Uh, although I do like the Mrs. Beak, not Mrs. Beakley. Yes, Mrs. Beakley in the new DuckTales is really good, but the old one was really good too. And she wasn't a secret agent. She was just like a chubby nanny, like old lady, but she was so like no nonsense. Her opening scene, the way she is introduced is um, Scrooge is trying to find nannies for the nephews and they keep scaring them away. And then, and she's there, like as the final candidate, 
holding them off with a, like a stool, like you would do like a lion tamer, like <laughs> with a lion. And she's so great. And she doesn't let them get away with stuff. Uh, and it's just great. Like she's just a very cool, like old lady. Like she doesn't need to be an action. I always say like action girl. I feel like so often nowadays women have to be action-y. And I'm like, why? Why can't they just be not that necessarily? It's okay to be action-y, but it's also okay to just be like a normal person. And she's just a normal person who like doesn't take nonsense from people. Um, boop, boop. Goslin? Gosling? I think I call, I, don't, I think her name's Goslin, but it's like, sh- this is from Darkling Duck, which if you have not seen that show, you need to see that show. It's so good. Um, if you don't know what the heck it is, it's basically, everyone's talking ducks and stuff because... You gotta. Uh, and it's like a superhero show. And Darkwing Duck is this like egomaniac. Uh, he was an egomaniac before Iron Man made it cool. And he ends up adopting this orphan named Goslin. And she is like a very sporty girl. She wears like a, like a jersey basically. And she, that's just her personality. She plays sports. She's kind of a kind of an obnoxious um, get into trouble kind of kid. And that's just it. You don't have to talk about her being a girl. You don't have to be like, oh, girls can't play sports or wear jerseys. It's like, no, she just does. It's just who she is. YOLO, like moving on with our lives. And like, thank you, 90s, for not shoving feminism down our throats. You can just be a girl and do what you want. Um, It's great. And finally, in this set of things, Gadget Mouse is the bomb. So this... <laughs> I feel silly talking about these shows. They're actually really good shows. When you explain them, you sound like a crazy person. So Chip and Dale, Rescue Rangers. Whoop. My camera keeps blacking out on me. I'm using my computer camera because my phone doesn't have a memory <laughs> for it. Um, Chip and Dale, Rescue Rangers is, it's like Chip and Dale, like little chipmunks. And they have like a detective agency, rescue agency. I don't know what you'd call it, where it's them and this mouse named Monterey Jack, who loves cheese and is Australian, and a little fly named Zipper, who's his friend. <laughs> so cute. Um, I love the detectives and talking animals, like Chippendale Rescue Rangers or Cat Returns. Who's not? Well, yeah, he's a detective agency. Or Sherlock Hound or Great Mouse Detective. I'm like, this is, I'm there. This is all I want out of life. <laughs> um... And Gadget Mouse, who I believe she's introduced as Monterey Jack had a friend and she's, who's dead now, and that friend's daughter is Gadget Mouse. And she is an inventor. And she invents all of the tech and machines for the little detective agency. She has a, a, a plane made out of like a, beach bo- a bleach bottle and <laughs> like a little balloon. It's so cute. You guys need to watch this if you've never heard of it. It's adorable. Watch it now. Um... But she's an Avenger, and she makes a little gun that shoots a, like, plunger suction cup, sorry, uh, thing. And that's, like, her role in the series. And yes, like, Chip and Dale both kind of have crushes on her, but it's never, like, actually that important. Um, it's actually really funny. <coughs> uh, and there's two episodes where I will talk about her, like, why she's an interesting character, so every, every few episodes, it's usually just them solving random mysteries, but again, like, there's some that focus on one specific character, like, there's one where Zipper, like, goes missing because he's sad, and one that deal. does Monterey Jack ever get his own episode? Anyway, <laughs> anyway, there's one where Gadget, um, joins a cult. This is where I, I'm, like, I'm, like, trying to explain this without sounding like a crazy person is impossible. So, she invents this little machine thingy that's supposed to be able to walk on walls and ceilings that's like a little suction cup like boop, 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 but it keeps ripping off and not working and she like is basically like oh none of my inventions lately have worked like maybe I'm not a good inventor and she loses confidence and joins a cult and the cult is called the cola cult <coughs> and they like baptize their like members in soda I'm not insane and I'm not having a fever dream I promise Anyway, but she joins this cult, and it's like, what? And then eventually, like, in order to save the other members who try to, like, save her, she has to, like, overcome her funk and save them. And again, it's not a funk over, like, oh, I'm a girl, or this or that. It's like, I'm an inventor, and I have to remember who I am. Like, that's me. And again, you could swap it out with a male character, and it'd be the exact same thing, and I love it. Um, 
on the other hand, you also have this episode where they save these, like, there's, like, a teenage squirrel girl and her little squirrel sister. Um, they save them for some reason. They have to babysit them. And, because all the, all the characters in the show are adults, even though they're, like, chipmunks and mice. Um, Gadget Mouse is not her name. What is her last name? Whatever! Maybe, I don't know, but she's a mouse and her name is Gadget. Anyway, <laughs> this is turning into a rant rave. It's supposed to be an essay. I haven't seen these things for a long time, you guys, so I'm doing my best. Um, but they rescue these squirrels, and a little squirrel, like, teenage girl, has this huge crush on Chip, and is super jealous of Gadget, even though Chip and Gadget are not dating, by the way, but she's super jealous of Gadget because, like, Chip and, and Dale, like, super look up to her and super depend on her, and she's super important to the team. Like, acknowledged by the show itself, she's a super important team member, and this girl, squirrel, is super jealous. And, like, what happens at the end of the episode? Gadget tells the little squirrel girl, his name is Tammy, because it's the 90s, like, you don't have to be like me, like, you just have to be like Tammy. Like, you're you're good enough. You're special. She says that, like, you're special enough. And it's so, like, good. And then, again, like, nowadays everyone's like, girls being, like, helpful to each other. I'm like, yeah, well, this happened in, like, the 90s. So stop acting like it's never happened before. Or, like, now it's progressive. It's like, no, no, no. Like, we've, like, regressed or something if we've lost what we had in the 90s. I'm sorry. Um, these shows were so good and so positive, and girls who, like, grew up, grew up, girls who grew up watch them, no, girls who grew up watching them, I feel like would have a much more positive idea of, like, femininity, and again, that little chunk is, um, of my essay, we have, like, what a princess should be, and then you don't need to, like, be like a man. This is just letting girls be girls, like, and they can be an inventor or a nanny or a, you know, sports kid, or a businesswoman. It doesn't matter. Like, just let women and female characters just be who they are, and don't make a big deal about them being women. Like, that's feminism. If you want the dictionary, dic I cannot talk, I'm done now. My brain's just, if you want the dictionary definition of feminism, it's equality between men and women. So if a male character can just be an inventor and maybe lose his, like, sense of confidence and join a cult, then maybe a female character can too. Or if there's a no-nonsense, um, I mean, honestly, like, Mrs. Beakley and, um, what is the butler's name? There's, like, a dog butler. I don't know what his name is. But, like, again, they're very similar characters, even though one's a woman and one's a man. I'm like, they're very similar. Uh, but yeah, like, don't make a big deal out of them being a girl and being like, oh my gosh, a girl? owning a business or playing sports or being an inventor and it's like yes like it's the current year and they, they they indeed can do that let's stop acting like they can't finally whew, let's see I'm making sure that I didn't forget anybody finally um let's talk about motherhood because again like this is a thing that people <sighs> modern feminism has like a very I don't know what they have issues with, like, mothers for some reason, even though they don't seem to have issues with fathers, except for father issues, but um, to back to, like, the fathers never hugging them. But anyway, <laughs> I'm so mean to people who like Captain Marvel. I'm sorry. If you like Captain Marvel, I sincerely apologize for my meanness. Um, two characters, well, two characters, and I'll be brief because it's getting really long already. Um, obviously literal mother bear in Brave. Um, I feel like people, like, give Brave a bad rap. Like, it's not a very good movie. I'm like, no, no, it's good. Like, just don't expect it to be a princess movie because it's not. It's a Pixar movie. It's a very different formula than this Disney movie. It's, it's Pixar. But I really love, I don't know what her name is. Eleanor? I don't know what the mom's name in Brave is. I'm notoriously bad at names. Um, but that mother character is so cool because... She is such a strong character. A, in, like, she's a great queen. Like, she knows how to be a queen and a rule and know all the stuff you need to know to be a queen. And she's trying to, like, knock some sense into the head of her dumb daughter who's like, I don't, I'm just going to run around, like, shooting arrows and not being responsible. But no, the, the queen is responsible, but also learns, like, has a character arc, whoop, where she, like, learns to understand her daughter. And that's what that whole movie's about, is two female characters learning to understand each other. But then Frozen came and <laughs> chocolate. I'm sorry, if you haven't seen my Frozen review, I'm salty. Anyway, <clears throat> but also she's like a literal mother bear. Where like she, at the end of that movie, like she literally like 
fights the bad guy to protect her daughter. Um, and another character, similar, a mother-mother character is, um, it's from the manga slash anime slash live action show called Erased, or The Town Without Only Me, which it will get its own video because it is one of the four perfect stories. But I'll just talk about the mom in it. She is such a boss. Um, and again, she's just a mom. She never throws a punch. In fact, I believe she actually at one point like holds back somebody who's about to slap a kid. And that's what she does. It's like she's a protector. She um, is trying to protect her son and and other people because like there's some there's someone going around. It's a really complicated story, but basically it revolves around like a child murderer. Hmm, that's like yeah. Um, and and it's really interesting because and it also involves time travel. That's not a spoiler. That's the actual premise of the thing. And there's like her trying to protect him in the in the one like the original timeline how it started where she tried to just make him forget that this happened that his classmates were like murdered she's like let's not remember it and then later on in the future she um she finally realizes like who she thinks actually did it and tries to like contact people who can stop them and then in the back in the past it's very complicated there's a part where she realizes because her son is like in the know he realizes that one of the little girls who's going to be murdered is being like horribly abused by her mother and her, and his, and her boyfriend like, horribly. And so he's trying to protect the little girl and he doesn't really want to tell his mom what's happening like ish, but she, the mom like begins to understand and then basically like lets the little girl like stay at their house and like gives her a hot meal, which is like the first hot like actual meal, not just like ramen cup. This little girl's like had in ages and it's really touching and it like destroys me emotionally. And and then at one point, like, I think that the mom's, like, about to, like, slap her daughter, and the mom just, and the good mom, the evil mom is about to slap the daughter, and the good mom just, like, stops it and, like, won't let her do it. And that's all she does is she just protects these kids. And it's so cool. And, like, what an awesome character. And then later on, like, I'm not going to spoil anything because it's way too good, but, like, I would say, like, in the last, probably, like, third or fourth of the story... She's, like, the ultimate, like, amazing, like, mother, like, perfect being. Anyway, um, she's so cool. And I feel like mothers don't get enough, I don't know, respect. And it, and it really bothers me because people are always like, oh, like, nurturing, like, that's so weak. And it's, like, incorrect. Nurturing people literally keeps society going. And it also bothers me where if you get paid to nurture somebody, like, if you're a healthcare worker or a nurse or a healthcare worker, you know, doctor, nurse, whatever, or a teacher, like, you're seen as, like, super important and heroic, but if you're just a lowly mother who doesn't get paid to do it and isn't a cog in the capitalist machine, then you're trash. Like, what a horrible world we live in where we only respect somebody who gets paid to do important work. Like, those are all important jobs, and they should all be respected. Um, but it's, it's, it's horrifying to me that there are people who claim to be feminists who still denigrate like nurturing mothers. And I'm like, okay, let's not call it nurturing. Let's call it protecting. Um, and that's my thing is I think like a pro feminist character and not, it doesn't have to be even be a literal protecting a child as a real mother. Just that sense of like wanting to protect someone who is weak. I think that that's like a feminist character. I said in my other video, I can't stand when people who claim to be feminist have their characters like denigrate men and that they should be protecting men. And that's, and that's my thing is like, if you really think that men and women are equal, then you should be okay with the idea that women can protect people. And I think it's very odd that when a woman protects somebody, it's seen as like, oh, that's just like a mother nur nurturing someone. And it's like, no, it's a mother like protecting someone or maybe not a real literal mother. Maybe it's like, you know, strong woman and weaker whoever man woman or child like why can't we see that as an important thing for a woman to do like why can't we see I don't know to me and I, again this is I guess I'm gonna like end the end the rant like this it's not a rant it's an essay I'm, I tried um to me I very rarely feel what do you call it um seeing myself in characters or relating to characters that's not really how I interact with media 
but I all the time am like, I want to protect that character. Like, even though I know it's a fool's errand because I can't and all my favorite characters will die. That's my feeling is like, I want to protect them. And I feel like a lot of women feel that way with, with the whole thing on the internet of like, you know, the baby or like, oh, my child, I want to adopt him. Um, I feel like women are the ones who do that. Like, I've never heard of a man being like, oh, I want to adopt this character or something. or I want to protect them. I feel like that's like a female thing of like, do not hurt that person or I will hurt you. Um, and I don't know. Like, it's not particularly feminist, but I think it's very feminine. Like, wanting to protect somebody and like smack whoever is willing to hurt somebody, I think is a very like female feminine thing. I don't know. Maybe I'm off the rails. But um, that's my essay. So yeah. And again, like the, all of this is like the same thing of letting women just be who they are um, and not making a big deal about it and like letting them protect people and allowing that to be seen as something important rather than weak. Again, if someone's a princess protecting a country, why are they seen as weaker than a general protecting a country? That seems messed up. Uh, if a mother is protecting her family, why is that seen as weaker than a, a, a father protecting his family? I think the problem with our society isn't that and that's my thing. Our problem in society is that faux feminists, not real feminists, don't understand or appreciate women. They only appreciate men, and therefore they only appreciate women who act like men, quote unquote. Um, and it really bothers me. But I hope that this essay has shown you um, that it, it's not true. And again, like this is from all decades. I feel like the horrible faux feminism thing is just the past like five years. But these awesome female characters, like the 90s, you had Disney Afternoon. Zelda has been around since like what, the 80s? Um, Ocarina, I guess, is 90s too. But yeah. And, and we are still making good things with Tangled and Brave and Erased. So I don't think that the horrible faux feminists are going to stick around if we don't let them. Like, women and men should demand better female characters, like the ones we have always had. And yeah, that's my essay. I hope it made sense. Uh, you know how to use YouTube, so I don't have to tell you to like, subscribe, yada, yada. Just do it. Follow me, please. <laughs> Thank you and goodbye.